Hello again, people at home and around the world. Louis Tucci here with Paul Gabriel live for the Zebra Summit 2022. The magic continues. We just had a stellar presentation from the team at Sony Santa Monica with the God of War swinging the chains and making it real. My Lord, the amount of detail. I am hyped. Can you tell? Uh, yes, I can tell. Yes, moving you're ready at the to speed go. of light. You got. It. Wow is, the, effects. wow is the right word, isn't it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, we're not done. We're, we're not done? We're not done we in any stretch of the imagination. But how do you feel about it so far? I feel fantastic. I feel great. I'm you, super You excited. want the book. I know you do. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm going to get it. It's going to happen. Well, guess what? Yes, talk to me. Next up, All right. a really uh, no stranger to the world of ZBrush. He's a nice guy, too. Mm -hmm. Always nice to see him. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be uh, Marco Plouffe, and he's going to be here with Chaos Maison. And it's, it's our pleasure to have him. We're going to be walking him into the stage. I am excited to continue the magic here across uh, day two. It's day three, really, if sure. you think about it. Because Your body we had a zebra, We had a zebra sculpt off. In case you missed it, you can check it out on, on our social media channels. You can recap. But let's bring, uh, let's bring out Marco Plouffe uh, from Chaos Mission, and we'll talk to him more about some things that he's been up to uh, right, uh, right now. Let's do it. Marco, you found your way back home with the ZBrush team here onto the green screen stage in oh, yeah. sunny Burbank, California. I'm here with Paul Gabriel, Louis Tucci, and Marco Plouffe finally makes his way to the ZBrush Summit. How are you? I'm pretty good. Pretty good. It's really nice to be back here after, uh, well, the last time that we had the event. So uh, it's pretty cool. New stage also. It's pretty rad. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty yeah. rad. You guys He's no know. stranger. This is number three for the summit for the you. Repeat right? offender. Yes. Number three. three. Exactly. The repeat. I think you're actually maybe the only one that's been three times that oh. I can think of. That's cool. So you're... You're in a special... Uh, Repeats blast. aside, he's been working with the Four Horsemen on a new project, is that correct? Zach Patrick. Mike. Yeah, You're yeah, exactly. Like that. That's been like the huge project lately, so it's cool because I'll, I'll be like showing a little bit of that today, uh, mm -hmm. or at least like okay. I'll use that as like my platform to uh, for my presentation. Man, it's good. I'm happy to be here locked and loaded and the hits keep on coming. I feel like the most blessed person on planet Earth. I get to I'm going to try and zip it up as much as I can. You know I can't, but uh, I'm looking forward to what Marco's going to be showing everybody. It's, you like your hard surface. It's no, no secret on this planet that Paul Gabry is a big fan of hard surface modeling. And Marco, we're not going to chat over you. We're going to let you take it away now. Give the people at home what they're waiting for. They're not waiting to hear us. They want to hear from you. Take it away, Marco. Poof. All right, cool. All right. Well, I mean, so it's the third time I come here, but uh, for people who don't know me, I'll still present myself. Uh, my name is Marco Plouffe. Uh, I worked for uh, 12 years in the industry as a character artist. And um, as an artist, I worked in uh, like a few studios like BioWare, ADOS. But uh, pretty rapidly, I created my own company called Chaos Masons with uh, Cedric Seo. That was uh, eight years ago. And uh, basically, I'm like the co-founder of the company. I'm also a business manager, an art director, an artist there. And uh, we've been uh, pretty blessed to be able to work with a lot of like AAA uh, studios doing character art. So, uh, so that's pretty cool. And uh, yeah, in my career as an artist or um, with um, Chaos Masons, we've been able, I've been able to actually work with a few uh, like pretty cool projects and some giants of the industry and whatnot. So um, like our most recent project was uh, Gotham Knight, where we did like, uh, I don't know, like easily like 60 characters for the project. Oh. And I mean, they turned out wow. pretty good. Like I'm pretty happy, like and some important characters as well. So uh, you say 60, six zero. I want yeah, the six zero. to make sure they get this. Six How big was the team that you, um, just him. It's just him and Cedric. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. No, we were like a team of, uh, we, we started with like a team of 10, then like we went down to a team of four, like a more on a more continuous Holy. basis. But it was a pretty long project. So like we, we were not, we didn't need to be like a, huge, huge team to accomplish all that. But you know what, in the end, it looked pretty cool. So like, I'm very happy about that. And um, so yeah, that was the last project. There's like so much more to come that I'm super excited about, but I can talk Zip about it Zip upper lip, he says, look at that. He even did the gesture. <laughs> you got plenty to share today, that's for sure. Yeah, exactly. But like overall, with Chaos Mason and everything, like we've worked on stuff like, uh, like The Witcher, Overwatch, uh, Apex, Borderlands, Outlast, Baldur's Gate. Uh, PUBG, and of course I'm, I worked for Mass Effect and um, and Do Sex since we've uh, like as a as a 
as a personal artist, but uh, that's a lot of video game, right? Yeah, that was a lot, of, a lot to take in right there. You're that like, was a lot to take a, in. I didn't take a, a breath, breath before doing the list. <laughs> pause for a second. Man, man, I can't believe that you and Cedric founded this eight years ago, too. That was a mind blower for me, too, man. Eight years yeah. ago. Holy yeah, time Lord. flies by, seriously. Yeah. So, uh, no, we're pretty lucky. I mean, we've put the efforts in, and uh, we're happy like to be able to show like everything we've accomplished so far. And, I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's just going up. Yeah, we applaud you. They've killed it. We all I remember the days when at the convention center with Marco, me and Marco, like eight. I would say nine years yes. ago, probably ten yeah, years ago. Yeah, and yeah. Cedric too was, I think, thirteen years ago. I was yeah. roaming around in SIGGRAPH. Yeah, one of the time we went, it was like pretty yeah. much at the beginning of the of the the company. So uh, mm -hmm. yeah, long. Congratulations, man. Yes, yeah. man. Thanks to you, Cedric, if you're watching. Keep going. <laughs> That's and true, he's got right? a cool hat on today with that. It's oh, under, yes. under these lights, it's like a hot pink. I like it. Yeah, yeah. it's pretty. Uh, it's pretty contrasty with uh, with the stuff, but I, don't know, I like it. I dig it. It's um, it's uh, me peacocking basically. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know anything about peacocking. Stay tuned. Here we go. Here we go. So, um, so yeah, I've talked about a lot of video games and stuff, right? But the um, the the thing is, like, lately my my passion has been with uh, collectible figures a lot. Uh, for people that follow me, like you've seen it, like I've been working a lot on. Um, like uh, on statues that can be printed and everything. And I've always did that in my career, but like in terms of like spending my own time on my own projects, uh, I've been pulling a lot, a lot of uh, efforts into creating like, uh, like IPs that can be printed and whatnot. So that's kind of like a bit of what I'll be showing today. And the reason why I'm so passionate about uh, the collectible industry is because uh, video games are all fun, right? But something I really love to do is to be able to create kind of like a like a moment with the character, like having in, having him in a pose and like you know, some composition. Time. Yeah, exactly. Kind of try to tell like a story in one frame and that sort of stuff. And mm -hmm. I feel this is something you can accomplish. And if you can print it and paint it afterward and make it look cool, well, it's uh, it's even better. So, I. Uh, when I was asked to come here, I was like, okay, well, one thing that could be cool is to show like a little bit of that, but make sure things like stay relevant to like the video game industry as well. And basically, I told myself I could show uh, a project I've been working on and a few of the like methodologies and the techniques that I actually used to get to the uh, end product, which was a printed uh, sculpture. But the thing is that pretty much like 90% of what I have to show is applicable to video game as well. So either if you like video games or if you like the collectible, collectible industry, uh, like I have nice things to show. It's good to see awesome. that and hear that overlap is about to be demonstrated because we know it and maybe now the general public will know it even more. Happens a lot. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, people ask me that question often and it's, it's, it's the same thing I say. It's like you can pretty much approach it the same way for a long time and then at some point like you choose yeah, what, a fork. Yeah, what fork you take, but a lot can be done before that. Um, so, yeah, um, j just before I start showing, I, I get into like the, the, um, the core of this. Um, some might know the Four Horsemen already. It's a series of character I've been working on for, uh, for a long time. It's the thing you can see on the screen right now. Also a stable in wrestling in the 1980s, but that's a different Four Horsemen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But those are, it's inspired. It's inspired, let's say. <laughs> yeah, Paul Gabriel. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! But the, uh, so, so I've been, a, like this was my first group of character that I created, and basically they were meant to exist into like a, a world that I, I, um, I worked in like behind the curtain, so like what that world is and like the character I could live in it and whatever, and I basically um, I basically created this website called Neopocalypse, no, neo-apocalypse.com, where people can learn about this universe. And this is a universe where the four horsemen uh, live, basically. And um, I've been created this other group of characters called the Archangels on screen right now, uh, which are basically like the sequel in the story. And I'm basically just creating the story to have like these characters exist in the world and have some backbone for whatever other series of character I'll be creating afterwards. And uh, the thing that i the most proud about this project is that it captured the interest of uh, some, like a company that's now a collaborator of mine called XM Studios. And we've been able to produce these character into uh, yes. printed statues and everything. Victory. And they look like pretty, Victory. pretty rad. I just want to show you something Superb. here. Mm -hmm. Superb. It's, uh, it's a little teaser. Some of you might have seen it already. But it's basically just like introducing uh, the first character of the series called uh, War. War from the Four Horsemen. And what you see right now is basically the actual statue uh, printed and painted oh, wow. uh, by XM. So it's my design. It's XM's production. And uh, I'm really happy to be able to say that it's the, uh, the first of the four that we're producing. It's uh, out on uh, pre-orders right now. 
Uh, and uh, I, I tell you, seriously, it's like one of my biggest accomplishments. I'm so, so you. happy Thanks. of like this. I bow to you, sir. Yeah. Well done. Well yeah, done. And they really did a great job for like the, uh, the production and everything. So seriously, it's really cool. One. So if you ever want to learn more about Neopocalypse, because I mean, I'll get to the good stuff now. But if ever you want to learn more about uh, the characters of that universe and have some cool uh, renders and ways to like view the characters and everything. Just go on neo-apocalypse.com. Go check it out. Uh, you'll be able to see the characters. Oh, you'll be that. able to actually also pre-order the characters as well. Gabriel? Wow. Yeah, I'm and sure. uh, if yeah. you're a video game uh, geek like me, you'll like to know that they all have their own stats. Yeah. They all uh, yeah, attack you get powers this? and he this made and that. stats for them all. Like, yeah, what's yeah. their strengths? <laughs> their agility? Pull up again. Let's see. Never mind the stats. I want to see the backstory for them all. The Look at this death again. Show the death again. Oh my goodness, la muerte. Yeah, this is one of the oh, four. Oh boy, sold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've been having a lot of fun, basically. Wow. I've been having yeah. a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. So well, you're killing it. it looks, they're, they're amazing. Yeah. They're thanks, man. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Beautiful. Really great. And uh, now, boof, straight transition to ZBrush, Look where you can thing. see. Uh, well, the actual sculpture. That's so, the sculpture for the statue you just showed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Way to look at this. So uh, basically, um, I'll be using like a few of these uh, these models to uh, to show my process today, and um, I'll I'll be starting it by explaining like a bit about how I went for like designing them, or at least finding like the main like general idea for these characters. Uh, although like I'm, I'm not necessarily like a concept artist or anything, there's still like a process that I like to use uh, for um, just giving me like a bit of a, like a, a stepping stone before I actually go in ZBrush. So I'll just really, really rapidly uh, show you uh, this uh, image right here. Um, as uh, many of us do, I always start by gathering references and that sort of stuff. And uh, really like, even if I don't really have like a, a specific idea of what I'm looking for, I'm just trying to get inspired by things that I find and everything. Maybe that I had an idea of like making the Four Horsemen because it's a, it's a theme that I like. And since I like to do hard surface, I knew I wanted to like make it with this kind of like visual. But I really started with just like capturing a lot of things that for me had some kind of like, um, uh, whatever. Like just something that inspires me, even if it's just a little detail of a, like an image or, or that sort of stuff. And this is, by the way, like a very um, short version of my reference. Like there's much more images normally. But still, I just do that and it kind of like helps me to like daydream about like where I want to go with things uh, without, I, without me doing like anything using my pen or that sort of stuff. You do this at the beginning of whatever you're trying to conceptualize? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I'm trying to find like just like a, a one-liner concept that, I, that is going to be like a driving force to go forward with everything. Sure. And doing this actually kind of like helps me to unlock things in my head and, uh, and that sort of stuff. So this is really like the first phase of it. And afterwards, um, like I said, not a concept artist, but still I like to just uh, push a little bit more and doing like some small like thumbnails and that sort of stuff just to just to see if like the vision that I have in my head just translates at least in this very early stage because thumbnails you can do that do them in like a few seconds and that sort of stuff so I just go through that but I don't really overstay my welcome with uh, thumbnails because at the end of the day I'm a 3d artist so I'll jump like pretty rapidly into uh, you're gonna thumbnail in ZBrush. Into yes. 3D. Yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll thumbnail in ZBrush, and this is where like the the ex exciting stuff, like at least for me, really like starts, right? But this is like a good way to just like just make it clear in my head where I want to go with things. And at the end of it, like the bottom section here is basically just like a like a few images that I find represents the best what I'm going for, and this will be the like most uh, abridged version of uh, the idea. Uh, and that's pretty much like all it is for everything that's like before ZBrush. But I just sometimes stop you for a second, that model on the screen that you have is 290 million polygons. Yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, by the way, uh, pretty good computer that you have here to be able to run this scene because like there's a lot there's a lot happening in here. And uh, of course, I mean I don't work on everything at the same time like this. Like I chop it off in like pieces. Yeah. How many subtools Paul Gabriel wants to know? 
What does Dude, it say? I don't know. I mean, right now there's like 138, wow. but this is not even the, the real yeah, amount because I merged one. things together yeah, yeah, for the final scene, working model. basically. So it's pretty catastrophic at the end. How but much I, I noticed on hard surface, you do use a lot more sub tools in a lot of cases in yeah. hard than you do in organic, I'd say. Yeah, exactly. So th thanks for like the folders and everything because yeah, that really, like, helps to sort hey, it out. No? Right there. Yeah, especially when I need to do like <laughs> there 300 you go. million pocket. This guy. Yeah. So, but uh, you know, at the end of the day, if I want to do like switch outs, like the hand, the hand just changed there, or like the the head just changed with the folders, it's just really nice to be able to just like do those switch outs and stuff, sure. especially in the collectible industry because it's it's a thing, right? To yeah, have switch different outs hands, different and stuff. hands. So uh, yeah, no, basically that's uh, look at that. Yeah, just basically. Yeah, just, just so, another day. Yeah, in the, just another day. In my presentation. So just do that, and like there you hey, go. We're done. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for coming. <laughs> So uh, yeah, um, this is like a, this is a demonstration of the uh, of the end product. But of course, like everything starts uh, somewhere more uh, more uh, humble. And um, basically, this is like a start a good starting point to show you like where the whole process goes. And from the thumbnail that I showed you earlier, like I'll still go through like having my characters in a T pose, A pose, whatever you want to call them. And for doing a lineup, something that I thought was very interesting to do is to start even like her earlier with these characters. Uh, this is like a, something that can actually get, um, like it, it takes more time to actually go through everything, but I like to have my characters be um, like constructed with layers, basically. And I always start a bit like I would do with like a, like a human character that has armor or everything. So I'll just start with what's the what does the character look like if he was, in quotes, naked as an android. And um, I also work on this like blocking the four characters at the same time because since there's a group, they're also like a unit. Right. As like even the four of them together are a unit and they have to have like their own differences and their body archetype and that sort of stuff. So like I'll, I'll start like very uh, normally with like a, like a human human based mesh. Um, maybe if I was doing like a beast, I would start from a sphere, right? But might mm -hmm. as well start with a humanoid uh, figure. And what I do, or at least what I did, is to be able to save on time, the way that I like to layer the character is to use poly paint to really break what is like, um, more like the underneath, maybe like the, the synthetic muscles and that sort of mm -hmm. stuff. And then I'll go like a little bit more of a gray and I'll use it to um, for everything that's more like maybe like the cloth that's over, that's holding things together, a bit like a fascia if you, if you want. And then I'll use a lighter um, yeah. poly paint just to express what's really like over as like the, yeah. the, the top surface of the character. And for me, this is like really, really a quick way to really cut into anything that would be more like time consuming um, for creating like at least like the body of the character because it's like there's all these tools to create like many like assets and stuff but I don't think it's like right now the moment really to do those things when you're exploring when you're looking for shapes you really want to use like what's the quickest so for one I'll use uh, poly paint like this and also uh, at some point I'll start working on like the, the layers that would be on top of the character here and the layers here, I don't necessarily use um, like a lot of subtool anyway. And just to give you an example here, like, um, okay. So you can see like the different colors. They're basically like all the layers that I will be adding on top. For example, if I click on this, this is basically a mesh that was hidden inside of the character. I'll do a little present uh, demonstration afterwards. But it was a layer that was kind of like hidden in the character and I just like extruded the shapes out of the character trying to define like what would be like the armor on top. But it's pretty much like all one subtool anyway, except maybe for like the shoulders that you can see were made of like actually two, um, two subtools yeah. here. Just trying to say that like I try to be very like efficient in terms of like not creating too much stuff that can be in the way. And, um, and yeah, that's like how I, I'm able to pretty much get to, like for example, this uh, result uh, within like maybe like uh, like a day or two, like for like the blocking of this character. The, right? You, right, what you have on screen now is in a day or two. Yes. Well, I mean, the the, the underneath of the character was a like a day. <laughs> the this whole thing here is a day or two. <laughs> All right. Well, I had a pretty good idea of what I was going for. Okay. Right? Like I. I you know, sometimes it takes. Max is going to say, "I worked four hours each one of those days." That's, that's like, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you need to be like, I'm. I'm saying like eight hours full time. Yeah, 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 really yeah, I started yeah, from a sphere, really. and I got this in four hours, and yeah. here it is. Enjoy. Well, you start from the human character, so yeah. <laughs> here we go. This guy. 
Jeez. But uh, but yeah, but seriously, sometimes I'll give myself the chance to explore further, and I'll just yeah. like like put it to the trash and start over and do something else, right? So, so I think that's good. You let yeah. go. Let go. Yeah, exactly. Let go and then start again. You'll probably. And that's why more. I don't want to spend more than maybe like a day or two for like doing a whole thing like this because like maybe if I'm gonna scrap it, then it's like well yeah. I need to spend it like. Don't again. get married to it, as I say. Don't get too married to it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And basically, all of the characters will uh, be. Uh, I'll do the same thing until I have like. So you create this, in essence, almost skeleton pattern poly paint thing for all your meshes. To start uh, with, for the most part, or just for these. Well, I mean, the, since they're a group, and I wanted to find like a way that they're unified in their design, I actually yeah. went uh, and I made them like naked. But if I was to do like a one-off character yeah. that you never see under everything. I'm not necessarily always going to spend like this amount of time, but since sure. it's like something more like a group, I was like, oh, that's worth it. Plus, like I thought it was fun. So even mm -hmm. if it were, it's not like the maximum efficiency, I thought that, yeah, that could be cool. And right. I didn't really know also how much armor I wanted to put on them. So I was like, well, at least I'll have what's under the armor already done. No, and it's all blocking, right? So yeah. it's like, I didn't spend like that much time on it. But uh, yeah, so just to go into like demo mode for, uh, for a second, right here, and I'll just take this character. Um, I'll split this off right now. And what I want to do is I just want to show you what I was um, talking about earlier where, um, like what I do when I start uh, concepting. Um, well, for this part, I mean, it's already done. Basically, this, just, this is just using clay build up, damn standard to find like the things and using poly paint. So I kind of like explained that. But to build on top of this, the way that I work, and it, it didn't really change from like when I started to do 3D, is that I will duplicate this character. I'll just make sure there's no like. Sorry, layers. I don't want to interrupt you, but I, I have this yep. question that's probably nagging a lot of people. Did you specifically make that uh, base for this project, or is that something that you do typically the way this looks? Oh, this is like a this is a, a base mesh that I use all the time. Okay. Like all the time. I have like a few, but they're all Great. pretty much just like like a, a certain like uh, archetype of body. So maybe like I'll have like a muscular one, sure. a, a more like skinny one, a female one, and that sort of stuff. I'm glad I asked you that. Yeah, but they all start from like, yeah, they all start from the same base. Um, so yeah, um, one of the first thing that I'll do is I'll just take this character, for example, and I'll just like uh, invert, inflate it. I always, used to I always like to use the transpose line with right click in this one here to do that. It's a really quick way to inflate. And you can see that now, like everything is inside of the character, except for like a few things sticking out, but whatever. And once that you have this, I'll pretty much start from there and build on top using like clay build up or that sort of stuff. So you see, you can simply like paint and whatever like, um, wherever you paint, like it basically like shows um, like what's underneath. And this is how like I build like the top layers and everything. So this is the, uh the armor pieces now. That yeah, you're, yeah, exactly. You're or like, I mean, it could be whatever you want, right? But mm -hmm. in this instance of this character, yeah, it would be like the uh, his armor and everything. So you see, I'll just use like clay build up uh, to kind of like give the volumes and everything, and then I'll use uh, damn standard to um, just create some like inverted uh, volume to create like edges. Yeah. Or uh, not using alt, it will create just like the cavities and everything. So I can pretty much just like get like my volumes, uh, get planes. If you use like ins and outs of um, of Dan Standard, it'll create your volumes like this. And to give it like a smooth surface, I won't even like start using like H polish yet. I'll simply use uh, smooth because smooth will smooth out your mesh, and a smooth mesh give already gives it a more like um, like hard surfacey look, mm -hmm. if I can say. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, or you can use like H polish. I'm just saying, smooth really does a lot of work, especially in the um, in the uh, blocking stage. You, you don't want to always have to change your brushes, so it's it's really nice that like the shift key uh, gets you there. What material are you using for this for you? Because you obviously want the reflectivity. It's a blend, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm in blend right now. You're just yeah. using a blend. Yeah. 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 Or uh, at this point, I'd say I'm, I'm not looking too much at the material. Yeah. It's, it was really just like I used the first thing that came here. Like if it was maybe this material, I would not sculpt with this one. Mm -hmm. But uh, or you could. It could be a challenge. It would be interesting. The next ZBrush challenge. Oh, you have to sculpt you using this material wow, only. Wow, that would be something. Here we go. It actually, might help because the normal map of that material, you would see the actual level change. Yeah. I'm not exactly. sure I can look at that for But you get, hours. you like blind yourself yeah, yeah, by the end probably. of the competition. 
Yeah. It'd probably yeah, get you squirrely eyed after a while. Yeah, sure. pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't heard someone say that in a dog's ear. Hey, well, there you go. I haven't heard that one either in a dog's ear. There you go. <laughs> I'm bringing it today, people. So the, um, the, uh, another tool that I like to use is uh, basically just curve strap snap. It's been in ZBrush for a while, and I just find it works really well to create like um, to create like any kind of like belt-ish kind of thing. Or it it cannot you can even be more than just a belt. You can basically just use it and say like oh you know what it's like a metal uh, trim for like other another piece of armor or whatever. And it's just like a quick way to have like a mesh inserted on your uh, model and do whatever you want with it afterwards. Mm -hmm. And um, I just love it. You just have to be conscientious that you need to use a um, a uh, mesh that doesn't have subdivision or like layers. This is why, once again, in blocking, I try to not use like too much like layers and whatnot, or have uh, subdivision levels to my mesh to be able to use tools like this. Yeah, you're keeping your freedom open. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Uh, so the same the same way with the the curve tube uh, snap. So if ever like you need to have like a like a tube or something more tubular like this, you can easily place it on your model, and then you go to your move brush and you start like placing it around and just figuring out like where it goes. Uh, I don't mind for the stretching and that sort of stuff at this stage because it's, once again, I'm just looking for shapes and forms and whatever, nothing. I'll never stop myself like polishing too much. And so even if like the tube has a stretch, it's like whatever, it reads as a tube, so it, it's fine, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so stuff like this, there's another, another one that I like to use as well. Uh, I don't have it in my quick shortcuts though because I don't use it often, but it's still a nice one. Curve quad fill for doing like vast but thin uh, regions. I just take something like this here. This one I might actually split it into another subtool just to have a bit more control over it. Like maybe to uh, reduce the, um, the, 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 the thickness. And uh, like I could, if I want to sculpt in it, now maybe the resolution is not uh, superb, but something that I can do pretty easily is, for example, let's say hide this polygroup. Uh, I'll do a mirror and weld. Um, I'll do an auto group because I know that there's like a mesh in the middle now that I did my mirror and weld. This way I have one continuous shape. I can just Z remesh it, let's say 2000 polys. That might be a little too much. There we go, a little better. And from there, uh, you can simply like give it like a quick, um, whatever, a quick shape to simulate like a cape. Just to be able to say like, ah, oh, well, there you go, that's a cape. And I use a lot of my imagination at this point to tell myself, oh, it looks good, it looks really credible. But you know what, as long as it reads, I mean, I'm good enough for like the, um, the, the, um, the um, concept thing uh, point. I like the stage. joy with which he said that. He said, I use my imagination, and he laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> People, you can use your imagination for the entire presentation. If ever I do something that looks ugly, just tell yourself, wow. No, it's in my so head. Good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so there you go. This is just a, a nice, like, quick way to create, like, a, somewhat of, like, a cape for the character. Um, so you don't put the little, it's interesting, you don't put the little silhouette window that we have. That's oh. Yeah, I've just like... You've just gotten used to doing I just got used to like always like pushing back the character and that sort yeah. of stuff. Right. I, uh, it's, not, it's, a, it's a great feature. We work in a similar fashion, you and me. It's fine. Carry yeah. on. There you go. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm just making an observation <laughs> you know for I mean? myself. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> it's all good. It's you all probably stop talking out loud when I'm thinking, huh? <laughs> hey, well, uh, we're all good here. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, something else that I, I like to do is just using the good old e extract... Uh, especially for doing like uh, just taking part of a mesh that like really does like follow the um, the, the silhouette of the character. So I'll just like mask like part of it. Let's say like this, and uh, I'll extract it. And I'm uh, most of the time I don't even look at like the the result. I'll just like commit to the extraction right away, because uh, like I do often, I'll just grab whatever like. Subdivision it gives me. Uh, sorry, not subdivision, but like uh, like mesh or shape it gives me. Yeah. Uh, always run it through uh, ZRE mesh to just get something. Uh, most of the time, it's to get a lighter um, like density of polygon, mm -hmm. and uh, the reason is because uh, with a lighter density of polygon, you just have more like flexibility into like melting the shape away um, and redoing the whole um, shape 
It's just because like it, the, the, the brushes react more uh, uh, vividly or they're more reactive to the shape. So uh, yeah. So once you get this here, uh, I'll put it into double again and you can simply like start moving it around, get like a hood shape pretty rapidly as well. And in the idea of uh, conceptualizing things, it just like helps to uh, really go fast and add stuff on top and, and whatnot. It's kind of weird, the, the, pressure is, uh, the pressure is very, um, is very uh, low. Like I have to press like super hard to get something. Oh really? Anyways, whatever, it'll, uh, it'll work. But basically, yeah, like I'll do that and this is just like the first step. You continue to do that and, or like I said, use your imagination now and just tell yourself like, wow, that looks pretty great. But yeah, that's the, basically the tools I actually would use to create some of those meshes. Um, the, um, I, sometimes for like stuff that I know that are going to be like floor meshes, like especially like shoulder pads and that sort of stuff, I'll go grab like the IMM primitives, maybe like uh, the sphere, let's say. Uh, insert sphere, there we go. And I'll just add them on top like this, split them into their own uh, subtool afterwards. And uh, after that, I can simply like start exploring the, um, like its shape in a very, um, yeah, in a very like uh, uh, typical like way of like sculpting the volumes and, and that, that sort of stuff. Yeah, I'm so, yeah, I'm sorry. It's like uh, it's really hard. The the pressure doesn't seem to actually go like pretty. Really? Yeah, I'll try to. Well, you see, if I actually just like um, makes make the Z intensity like higher, it actually uh, works a little bit better. I'll tell you what, we modulated it because you said you were so fast. We wanted to see if we could slow you down a bit. <laughs> How's that for on the spot? Yeah, I guess I should not have said that, eh? I <laughs> shot could, myself uh, in the foot. We could try re restarting the Wacom driver and see. Yeah. Got a controller um, on that thing. Well, I mean, it's not, it's not really gonna, gonna like stop me, uh, stop me enough, I'd sure. say, so uh, it, should okay. be, uh, it should be okay. But whatever, this is not really a demonstration of the whole process, this is just me like showing like a few uh, like quick tricks that I like to use while doing concept. And uh, yeah, and of course, I mean, uh, just to say that Dynamesh is always my friend. At any point, if I do like a transformation to the mesh that's going to like, just like hinder my uh, my resolution to create like volumes and stuff. Of course, I'll always just dynamesh whatever I have in this uh, instance. And so at this point, I'll actually uh, end up having, uh, boom, boom. like I'll, I'll end up like creating something like this out of just like using those tools. Everything that you see on the character right now, uh, I'm like pretty certain doesn't have like one single tool that I just didn't show like right here. So it's all about just like figuring out like what looks good, exploring like the designs and everything. And then you have like your, um, you have your character in this uh, level of, of uh, detail, which is, like I said, um, since I'm using tools that are pretty simple, you can get there like relatively fast if you like know what you're going for with the design and everything. So you can have like this whole group of character done like pretty quickly. And once that you have them, then you can start really figuring out like what uh, looks like, how they can be like different but similar at the same time, right? Because mm -hmm. since they like a group of this, uh, like a character called the Four Horsemen, they have to look like they're part of the same group, but you don't want to do four times the same character, so you kind of like, you have to find like what makes them different one from the other. Like Death here for me, the example, like my goal was to make him look kind of like a necromancer. So all of his like armor, they kind of look like skulls mm -hmm. or like animal skulls or human skulls. Even if it's just like, it's not really like a head, it, it has kind of like a, skull-ish aspects to it. Whereas War right beside him had to look more like a dark paladin. That this is like, this is what I was going for, right? But I figured that out while I was sculpting the characters, like the, 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 the look of them and the look of their armor and everything. Her was more like elegant, that sort of stuff. And uh, Famine here was more like uh, like disheveled, fallen knight, that sort of stuff. And those are all, thing, all things that I pretty much like figure out uh, when I'm um, when I'm sculpting the characters inside of ZBrush, because it gives me a little bit more time while I work on like maybe like uh, finding my shapes 
uh, I find that like it gives times for my my brain to just like see like to, to, to just figure out what I see and what I like and get to um, get to something uh, that I find is a good direction, something that I will commit to push further afterwards. Um, at this stage, I'm not done with the blocking though, because something, especially when it comes to uh, printing, something you want to block is you want to block the final pose of the character pretty much right away. Um, so, for example, like this is like the, ne the next target in my process. I'll try to have the character posed uh, in the blocking. So you see, like if you look closely, it's still the blocking. I didn't do anything more. Well, I mean, there's now a horse. That's something more. Yeah. But it's he's got a brush for that. Yeah, exactly. The, the horse. Brush. I M M horse. He blinks. I M M horse. 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 <laughs> do, 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 do. Processing, and yeah. there it is. I M M horse. And the um, the uh, it's a really good brush. Uh, thanks for adding it to ZBrush. And, uh, it's our but, pleasure. Yeah, yeah no, no problem. Uh, but whatever, I mean, the, the horse was the same process. So it's just rinse and repeat the whole thing, but just start from horse. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea is to be able to get to this, uh, to get to this thing right here. And um, the way that I go by is that I'll just take, for example, uh, my posed uh, model. And I'll decimate it. I'll create uh, polygroups just for like some of the sections, even like if the section is, uh, is merged, like this belly section here, I'll take it. And this way, from like a character that stands in an A pose, it's really just a matter of like moving the character around and finding the right composition, because since they're in different like poly, um, poly groups, you can always just uh, use uh, like the transpose line, control click on it, do like a, a bit of a blur, like a masking blur, and you can always just rotate the character around until you pretty much like put it in a pose that for you looks like uh, it would make for a great composition at the end. Um, I'll, I'll go into detail of like the posing later on a more complex character, mm -hmm. but this is just to say that from the very, very beginning, I want to know where I'm heading. Like it's very important for me. Uh, it's a thing, because, like it gives me confidence, I'd say, to uh, commit to my character and to push forward because the next step afterwards, like the polishing and everything, they'll take like much more time, right? Mm -hmm. And you, you, if you commit to do something that's gonna take a lot of time, I find that it's always better to know like where you're going so that you're not yeah. too much in the dark, right. or at least less in the dark. Yeah. At least like. clear about your intention. Let me, let me slip a quick question in there for yeah, you. Yeah. Um, how do you circumvent or overcome the, the hardship of the, the hard surface parts when you're posing that? Let's say you had like, uh, an elbow pad or a knee pad in this case, but how are you avoiding the sort of distortion? It's a, it's a very good question. If, if I could have almost asked you to ask this question for my next uh, step, so yeah. that's pretty great. It's not even scripted, I just, you know, this is what we do here. Yeah, exactly, well, I think we were mind reading as well. Yeah, because this is where I was going. <laughs> brothers and Z, brothers and Z. Yeah, exactly, brothers and Z. Basically, the, um, the idea is that this blocking here, um, it can stretch, it can do whatever it wants, and like, I don't really care with it. Because the thing is that if it does stretch, I'll know that it's something that I need to change on the design before I go further into like, polishing. So it's really the time to make those mistakes and to see what's really gonna work or not. And especially when it comes to the, the, um, the final pose of the character, well, I'll know that like, if I actually do something like, extremely exaggerated, well, I have to have the design kind of like work for it the same time. So this is the one thing that's cool about uh, sculpting is that sometimes you can also sculpt for the final pose, actually, not for like every condition of like the movements and everything. Right. So this is kind of like a, a one little like cheat thing that's kind of fun in terms of like matching design with um, 3D print and uh, statues and whatnot. So if you look at this character, for example, it's kind of hard to say because it's still like pretty like blocky, right? But you can see how like the, the back of the calf uh, armor actually goes inside of mm -hmm. the, the thigh armor, while this is kind of like for me a good uh, demonstration that in the uh, posed character, or at least let's take the one that looks good, in the posed character, well in this section here, I'll need to maybe like cut it just so, so it allows for more space before I um, do the polishing. That's yeah, especially if you've gotten that deep. This is the biggest problem I see with hard surface. They go too soon trying to do the cool polishing parts. Mm -hmm. And then once they get moving, they're like, uh, this is all not working together anymore. And then yeah. now you're reverse engineering trying to go backwards. And, and that's, the thing, that's the thing that's fun, is that if you know things ahead, I mean, you won't fall uh, like in these pitfalls. But yeah. 
at the same time, I mean, I did fall in a couple of pitfalls uh, over my career, and I still do. And there's always yeah. a way to fix it afterwards, and it's fine, right? It's not. There's no like real point of no return. It's just like, oh, you might save like a couple of hours, maybe, if you just like think ahead. I like think the thing to be yeah. careful of for people who are just getting started is burning out on um, artistic sort of um, stamina. Yeah. And then just realizing, oh God, I have to go backwards, and like now I don't have yes. the energy to fix it. You know, that's a reality for a lot of people. So yes, indeed. They feel like, so deflated, you know, that they, oh no, what have I done? Yeah. So this is just like giving you like a little bit of like extra stamina, I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one thing I can say also, by the way, is uh, this was my T pose for the horse. Like I already knew I wanted the horse to do like um, like a, I think it's called counting when they go on their uh, legs like this. Anyways, whatever. Oh. Like I wanted the horse to be kind of like in that position, so I actually modeled him in this position, knowing that the end result is like pretty close to this. I'll do that sometimes, not all the time, because like uh, it's fun to work on a character that has like a nice gesture and everything. Mm -hmm. But I found that for the, ho the the horse, like it was inspiring enough to do it in that pose here. That like that's what I went for. It just helps for the final posing of everything, I'd say. Speaking of the pose, I really like, I like death the way that you have handled the sort of inflection or the bending of the um, abdomen region. A lot of people don't do that. You know, he's got him. do you see that, Paul? You see how he's like lurched over a little. Yeah, I was inspired by the Napoleon uh, painting. Yes. Like him on the horse. Now that you say it, it's, it's so stark, it's right there. Yeah. So, um... Oh, look, they're all there together. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the, um... A whole community of killers. Just, uh, put them a little bit more lined up. There we go. It's very powerful to see them all there lined up like that. Look at that. There's not even enough screen space for that stuff. Yeah, I, but also I, I think it's like very important to be able to view them as a group like this because once again, for the same reason I, I said earlier, you kind of like want them to look like a, a unit, like a legion. Really, oh, like they look form. like a legion, all right, you know. Yeah. Absolutely, it's great. Yeah, and uh, also an extra thing, uh, I, I like to think about like how they're gonna look on your shelf if you have the four of them. Like for me, like this is like the winning composition. You know what, short story, uh, I did an interview. Uh, if you go on neoapocalypse.com. I've been again. sharing it, I've shared it. He's, huh? he's in the chat right there, that's what he's doing. Don't yeah. think he's texting his friends. He's, he's well he is, he's, he's communicating <laughs> with all of our friends. Thank you, chat, Paul. Yep. He's sharing it in the business. chat right now again. Yeah. And if you check the interview on the website, uh, I, you'll see that the, the statues are in the background. Well, I didn't even did it on purpose, but I ended up placing them in the exact same composition. Oh, really? Just yeah, by default. Just yeah. By de yeah. Because I, I think it's just like I, when I did it, I, I figured out like this was like my favorite composition, and just naturally I went back to like this composition when I placed them in the background. Yeah, I can for see the that. Looking good, man. Looking yeah. good. I feel good just looking at this thing. <laughs> there you incredible. go. Incredible. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, at this point, if you if you feel it, I mean, you've you've pretty much covered like the design of the character, at least the main shapes and everything. You've designed the, the pose. You've designed them as a group. So it's like, okay, well, when you have this, now you can pretty much like decide to go into something that's more like a commitment. So like the polishing and everything. Excellent. Yeah. I actually also used this like image almost to show it to a couple of my friends to ask them like, do you think there's like potential into creating this project and maybe like get the in, like the interest of the people? Uh, because since we're doing like statues, like people have to like buy them to show like there's the support, well, right? Yeah. So it's like, do you think like there's going to be like a, like a clientele for this? I think the answer is yes, 100%. Well, thank you. I appreciate this. I have to sit back when I say that, 100% yes. There is an audience waiting for everything. But you want to have also like something to show them to be like, because you don't want to tell them like, oh, I have this idea about the Four Horsemen. You want to have like something that you can like show them and be like, hey, what's your feeling about this? And I find that this is pretty much the quickest way to get like the more the more bang for your buck, let's say, right? Because like yeah. you didn't spend that much time. It took a while, but just imagine if that was like all in polish, it would have taken like months and months instead of like maybe like a few weeks, right? So, and it does like. <laughs> A few weeks. I like his a few weeks. Your concept it's of like, time is. Yeah, hey, this is a few weeks for every, everyone. Else, everyone else, eh, it's about six months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd like to say I think he might have a skewed concept of time here. Yeah. I, know, I just think because he's perfected his workflow, so that's what I'm saying. This is the one that you guys get double buckled up for Marco, man. This workflow he's perfected. He's not messing finished. around. Yeah. Well, it's all like I said. It's all based on efficiency. Like I, yeah. I, I, I'm not stopping time when I work. It's really just like. I think I figured out like a few of the shortcuts that just like help me like go through uh, a few steps that sometimes like you can get lost in and sure. that sort of stuff, right? Yeah. Um, so at this point, um, this is for example like the uh, the the polishing. 
of uh, death in its A pose, T pose, whatever. This is the polished version that we're looking at right now on the screen. Yes, yes. This is basically like the final version. The only thing that's not there for this character is like the cape. This portion of the cape is still like the um, the, um, the, uh, the 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 blocking. Mm -hmm. Because I knew that this character, like the, the cape. Let me get back to um, the actual final model. The cape of this character is extremely flowy and it really plays with the composition and everything. So there was like no purpose for me to make this cape in, uh, in symmetry or in T-stance, right? Like I knew that like it was, it, it was going to have like a lot of like movement and everything. So I basically like told myself, well, this is gonna wait for after the posing. Uh, which is actually like one of the, the, the subject that like I wanted to talk about is basically just knowing like when it's time to do um, something in T-pose, when it's time to do something uh, like in posing, right? And I find that there's like many schools of, school of thoughts because I know a lot of artists that they're going to pose like the naked, the naked character like pretty early or like a, like a um, uh, kind of like, a, not early in the sense of like blocking, but early in the sense of like the elements on the character, like mm -hmm. pretty early they're going to pose the character and just finish it like in their final pose, which is absolutely fine. I think this is like a great way of, work, of working. Sure. But you know, like when you're working with a lot of sub tools, uh, stuff like that, uh, sometimes, like especially when it's like hard surface and everything, sometimes you kind of like want to have like a lot of your character finished in T-pose before posing him. Um, so you kind of like just have to be um, like, you have to make choices, I guess. And for me, the cape was one of those choices. Let's do it at the end. And the rest, uh, since it's pretty much like symmetrical, like I can pretty much do it right away. Or if you know that a mesh is not really gonna bend or anything, yeah, you can do it in a stance right now. Like for example, like the hood part, uh, anything that's cloth here or like this like upper cloth, um, section, like I knew that in the final posing of the character, it will probably not be bent so much. So it's not like if any uh, modification to this part would make it look like bent or whatever. So yeah, I thought that this would help a lot. Um, so in the same idea of like, what do I do now? Uh, another one is just to think ahead about like what you want to use like in symmetry. And uh, something that I do for, uh, for my character, oops, not this one yet. Sneak peek. This guy, <laughs> sneak peek. Um, so there's something I do for my characters is that the, the, the position of the arm and the position of the, um, at least the position of the upper arm and the position of the thigh, I try to make sure that it's somewhat like on a straight line so that from the Z axis, I can still work in symmetry for those, uh, for those models here. So if you use local symmetry and you put yourself in like Z symmetry, you at least you benefit from having this like model be in the scene on the character, but be somewhat of like an orthographic view so you can actually just use um, the symmetry. For parts like uh, the gauntlet or uh, the, the greaves, like the tibia section, uh, for those what I do is I always take my, my blocking, I place it into like another scene and I construct uh, those pieces in orthographic view like this here. So this is done like fairly easy because it's just a matter of grabbing like a section of your character. Like you can basically just like take this one here, clone it into its own, um, its own Z tool. You erase sections of it um, like this. And then you basically just place your floor, remove perspective and you aim for like the center. Oops. All right, like this, rotation. You pretty much just get like a ballpark, um, a ballpark um, estimation of like if it's in the middle. And then you just mirror and weld. And if you haven't lost um, like too much volume, well then you know that like you're pretty much like smack in the middle of your, uh, your mesh. You can even like move it like this, try to just like eyeball what's in the middle. And you see, like something like that, you haven't lost much volume. You can always get it back by simply like doing this. And um, this thing, if I do the high res of this, I'll know that like I can always just place it back on the character afterwards and like it's gonna fit, um, it's gonna fit at least 90, 95%. So the modification you'll need to do once it's on the posed model, it's not going to be like really big. So um, this is pretty much like the, um, like the idea for anything that's not in a kind of like a orthographic uh, view of the character. So 
basically this was the idea of like, what do you do now? What do you do in pose? So if we jump into, uh, okay, so how do you do all that, that polishing, like in more, uh, mm -hmm. in more uh, precise steps, uh, we can take uh, part of the character, for example. I'll just create a little screenshot of him right there. Just as a kind of like a, an example of like where I'm going with this. And uh, ba -da -ba -boom. let's just take my blocking, which is this one here. All right. So how do I get from uh, the blocking, or at least like this armor section, to um, this section here, which is more finished? Uh, that is the question. So I'll start by basically just like splitting everything into like auto groups. Just to kind of get like only the part that I want to I want to be working on. It's going to be this one here. Activate symmetry, and I'll start by simply like isolating kind of like the section I'm going for. Hiding it, deleting everything that is hidden. I'm using my shortcuts for those, and then I'll just get enough resolution on the mesh so that I can start using um, poly paint. And what I'll do is I'll just quickly, oops, yeah, this is a good one. I'll just quickly draw the uh, the, bun the border of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Also, uh, sometimes I'll draw if I want like negative space in my model. Like let's say like this was this is supposed to be like a a hole. Yeah. I'll also uh, mask this portion out. But this is like a pretty like a full mesh, so this is going to be fine. Once that I get this, I simply do a um, um, mask by intensity to change my poly paint into like an actual mask. So uh, mask by intensity, this is in my shortcuts, this is where I place it. I'll hide this, and I'll just see if there's like a, like a, um, like a hole in my uh, mask, which there's none which means that I can reverse this, uh, delete everything. There are subdivisions, so whatever. Delete, and now if I auto-group this, I have this section that is all clean and whatnot. And from this here, the next step that I'll take is basically just get rid of everything that is kind of like mid-details or actual details. I'll simply use like the clay uh, brush to kind of like get rid of it visually because the step afterwards is going to rely on uh, like one of the algorithms. So what I'm doing is I'm just like doing something that I'm sure is going to help like the, uh, the algorithm to understand like what I'm going for. So getting rid of like anything that could be distracting. And I'll even start kind of like emphasizing uh, on what's like what's my goal? Like what, I, what, what am I going for in terms of the planes? of the object. And if you look at the planes, I'm basically like drawing them right now. Like this is what I'm gonna go for. Like you can, it's all bumpy and stuff, but you can see what I'm going for. There's this section, there's this section, and this one here is split in this one and this one here. Once that I have this, I can even take H polish just to give it like a little extra uh, clean pass, let's just say. A very slick series of operations you just demonstrated there without yes. even batting an eyelash. Did you catch that? I caught it all. <laughs> on it. It's a good thing it's being recorded. We can watch yeah, it again later and watch regular it again human and again. speed. Yeah, I'll tell you, this is really rinse and repeat. This is like, this, like when I do like my streams and everything, like I always tell people, you always need to start working on like this part, this part, this part. Right. And it feels like it's always like this three, three steps that uh, is just going to help you in the long run. So um, the first step was like the, basically the, um, the piece itself. The second step was its edges. And the third step is its uh, planes. So right now what I'm doing is I'm just making sure the planes are readable. And I've used the edges right before to kind of like insist on where there's a plane change. Once that I have this, I'm actually pretty much ready to get my, uh, my final mesh for this character. So what I'll do, uh, my fellow mesh will be a Z remesh, but right now it's uh, kind of like a uh, Dyna mesh. So what I'll do is I'll simply start to kind of like select 
the areas that I want to be really like the different planes. Since they're really visible, because I've used the, uh, the cavity and everything, I can simply go over like this, hide them, give them different poly uh, groups. There we go. And now uh, all of my planes have like these like different sections here. And by the way, I mean, there's going to be other planes on this character later when I'm going to be placing the mid-level details and that sort of stuff. But this is pretty much like uh, what I do is I break down like what's major shapes and then what's like the other like less, um, like, um, how could I say that, less um, like elemental things, let's say. So uh, these, I do these because what I want to do is before I said remesh, I want to put the uh, keep group option on. And what I'll do is I'll simply click Z remesh with my key group. And it's going to give me, uh, oops, I actually put the resolution too high. So let's go back and try with uh, maybe a th around like a thousand polys. Yeah. There you go. Okay. So I'll just do that again. All right. So for most of it, it's pretty good. Uh, I got like a little artifact here, and I could actually just like try to to um, to fix it by hand. Or what I could do sometimes when I get like stuff like that, it happens. I just try to use like the other uh, Z remesh option, which is like the one where you click um, you click uh, the alt, alt the alt key. Yeah, yeah, the alt key exactly. I cannot use it in my shortcut. You see, like it actually gives me like something different, so that's good. Um, so when I, when, I, when I get this, sometimes you'll get like meshes like this, but most of the time you can actually get some pretty good results and you can always fix it by just reapplying another Z remesh on top of it. And you get something that's actually pretty clean, uh, really fast. So you might say like, oh, but you lost, like it, it got, it got like, like smoother and stuff. And yeah, sure, it, it did, but I mean, it's never like something that you cannot like repair uh, relatively quickly. You can get back like the shapes that maybe might have been like too smoothed. Like even it, when the algorithm works like from the get go really quickly, I find that it's always better to just like start really working on having the shape that you want, the silhouette that you want at this stage here. So now you have this, you see it's much cleaner. You can already see like where I'm going in terms of like having it polished. So what I'll do is I'll do a little bit of the same of what I just did before, but like with this mesh now. So I'll start kind of like making sure that like the curves, the elements of this object are um, more in line with like the final result that I'm going for. So what I'll do is I'll look at it from like different views, try to make sure that the line flow of my, um, of my mesh is kind of like clean. Like if you look at this line here and the line that it does, at this point I'll try to make sure that like this aspect of it is um, is good, because it's probably going to be like the final state of this um, portion. So that was for the the line flow and that stuff. And now once I got the entire piece, one, once I get the uh, the edges correct, so two. Now I work on three, which is the planes on the object. So what I'll be doing to get something clean is I'll actually hide them uh, one by one using uh, their polygroups once again. I'll just uh, use a material that is just easier to uh, see. And I'll just H polish things so that they look uh, like flatter, more hard surface. I'll do this for every section. I use a combination of Alt and uh, not pressing Alt when I use uh, H-Polish. Hey, what does the Alt button do? Uh, it kind of like just like, instead of like, like pushing in the shape, it kind of like elevates it like a little bit higher. Well, Both of them are trying to flatten it to a certain like average, but there's still like a direction that it goes. And I find that it's really good. And another thing that I find that using the Alt key does is for example, let's say I, 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 I use it like this. Look at this part here. If I don't use Alt, it's kind of like crushing this mm -hmm. part in. But if I use Alt, it's elevating it without really affecting like in the radius of the brush also. So there's that that you can use at your advantage actually. 
Uh, in this instance, I find that just like hiding sections like this is like works well for me. And although although they 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 still like have like they're a little bit bumpy between themselves, uh, this will be fixed in another step. I'll show like right after. And the final one, like for this curved section here, I won't be using H polish because. Uh, um, the thing about H polish, since you're flattening stuff, sometimes you might lose a bit of like your uh, your curve. And one thing that I find really um, works well for me is using sm the smooth brush, but by removing the shift key from um, the alt smooth. Yeah, like the alt uh, smooth. I, I I call it the smooth relax. Like I don't even know if it's yeah. its name, but it's a, a smart polish smooth brush, which is now it's called officially alt smooth. Alt smooth. Because we All shipped right. it now, you can actually make that your default. Smooth. Can I still call it smooth relax? Yeah, yeah. You can call it I call it relax. Awesome. In fact, that's how I explain it. I explain it more as like you're relaxing the topology yes. more than pushing. You're holding. I, I like to go key. a little step above and say it's like Superman. I'm not pushing Ooh. through the wall. Oh, look at this. I'm just only climbing on the wall like Spider-Man. Just good. relax. Paul Gabriel. Just relax. So I could, have, I could not have said it in better words because that's what I'm trying to do with this mesh here. If I use, use H polish, like I'll probably start like crushing the, um, uh, this like curve here. It's not a big curve, but still H polish is gonna start like flatten stuff and I might lose um, like the volume that I have. Uh, and Alt will kind of like elevate it, but add like planes to it. So the, I feel that like using, um, so it, it's smooth and it's not the normal smooth because normal smooth is basically going to like flatten your mesh also, you see? But by using, so you press shift, you click on the screen, you remove your finger from shift and now you smooth and it kind of like does not, you see it didn't destroy my volume but it did relax pretty much everything so that like I get rid of like the uh, more like uneven aspect of this mesh. So now you see it kind of like looks huh. pretty clean. It's like a Tuesday afternoon smooth, very yeah, relaxed. Exactly. A Taco Tuesday afternoons. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and yeah, there's one last thing that I do in order to really like bring it to like its maximum level of polishness. Uh, but this one requires that I create a thickness for the, the the piece first. So I'll I'll just do a little um, well panel loop. I'll use my shortcuts once again. I pretty much put all the sliders to the minimum. I just decide of like the the the, the good thickness. And I press uh, ignore groups because I have polygroups, right? And I don't want to create uh, different meshes. I want it to be all one mesh. Mm -hmm. I click panel loop and now I have uh, my thickness here. So it's pretty cool, that's pretty great. And uh, from there, from there, from there, um, I'll just make sure that um, all of the hard hedges or hard corners, or at least the corners that I want to keep um, kind of like sharp and stuff, I'll just make sure that they have creases. So, first step, I can already tell ZBrush, hey, you know what, everywhere there's like po different polygroups, I want you to create, to add creases. So crease polygroup, now there's like dots on the, on the lines here. I know this is gonna stay sharp. And I do the same for every corner I want to, to keep sharp. Uh, my favorite way is to actually use the Z, the Z Modeler tool. So I just switch to Z Modeler. If you go on an edge, you can choose crease, edge, and then you just click every edge that you want to uh, keep uh, hard. You could also use um, um, polygroup by normal to kind of like let the, the, so the, the software uh, do, um, like basically choose where to press to put the polygroups and stuff, uh, creases, well polygroups and creases. But I kind of find that doing it manually like this works pretty uh, rapidly as well, so there we go. So now that we have that, uh, this is pretty, uh, pretty like um, important in the pipeline because what it does is that if you subdivide, so you see I'm subdividing, but I keep uh, the hard edges where I want, okay? So this is where I'm going for with the creases. But I'll just do one last step before doing that, and it's to add this final level of uh, smoothing. First of all, I'll create a store morph target just in order that I can come back to this state of the mesh if I want. And what I'll do is I'll go in deformation. And you see like all my tools are all like one next to the other, right? So everything I'm showing with my shortcuts, I just get to do them like extremely rapidly because they're all there. But just to show you like this is where you would find it, polish crisp edges. 
And with Polish Crypt's edges, you'll see that all of my surfaces that still have like artifacts and stuff are going to get pretty much like to their like most smooth that they can get. So Polish Crypt edge, I just I don't put a lot, and you see, it's already like much much smoother. See before, after, before, after, works pretty well. And the reason why I did a morph target, it's because if you look in this area here, it got pretty round, and maybe that's not what I want to do, but with... You made that look really simple. I'm a, I just want to say to you... It is simple. Oh, yeah. It is simple. It's just that, like, you kind of, like, have to understand, like, the way to go by it so that the, 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 the tool really, like, responds the way that you want it to respond, right? right? Like, you have to give it a chance, and this is why I did the preparation before to really make it, like, the kind of curve that I want and the kind of edge that I want so that this, like, more, like, automated process just makes it clean, like, instantly at this point, at this, like, moment. And, uh, yeah, so... Um, so I'll just grab my morph brush, and because I saved the morph target, everywhere that I paint, I'll just get like the shape how it was before. So, uh, like I'm pretty happy with the rest of the result, but like that curve here was a bit too uh, polished, and this is how I prefer it. At this point here, I pretty much have uh, the mesh how I want it to be with the uh, surfaces all cleaned and everything. So I can go for the actual subdivision of the mesh. And what I'll do, is I'll simply tell him to, to, like, to, to do a crease level of, let's say, uh, one, so that my first subdivision stays a hard surface, and my second subdivision actually starts to smooth where my creases are, so that it creates kind of like a little like round bevelly um, like aspect to my mesh. If you find that this is too round, you can always go back before it smooths, putting to two of crease level, Give it another, uh, another crease level, and then uh, when you subdivide, it gives you that round crease, but this one is tighter than the first one. So it really just depends on like if you're going for tight creases or more rounded creases, basically. So uh, you have this. The next step afterwards, it's like, it's like another chapter, let's say. It's more about like creating the, the mid-level details, because now you have your mesh, and this is the mesh you're going to keep for pretty much the rest of... Uh, the time that you're working on this character. So at this checkpoint here, um, you need to like know that you're not really going to need to do much more like changes that have to do with the topology of the mesh. So we're really going into like sculpting now at you're this committed. point. Committed. You're committed. You're committing committed. to something. Committed. A point of no return. Well, like I said, it's kind of like point of no return E, but at the same yeah. time, there's kind of like ways to go at it, right? Because I can always right. just like said remesh what I have, tell him to keep the polygroups, reproject. There's a lot of tools that I can have. Mm -hmm. It's just that they, they're not going to be the quickest way to get to your, your ends, right? So you kind of like want to just be thoughtful at this moment because it's kind of like point of return E, yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, at this point, since we're not really going to change the mesh anymore, that's when I'm going to start using the layers just to like, be able to do like before and after on my work. So I'll add this layer, and I'll start to add uh, mid-level details to this mesh. Um, my style is that I always start with like, some uh, trim details. And the way that I go at it, I'll just show you um, the way that I did it for the horseman, is basically just to um, isolate the edge, uh, shrink it, and at some point, Control shift S people. Control shift S. And yeah, control shift yeah, X yeah. for grow and shrink. <laughs> grow and shrink. Exactly. X. And once that you have actually the section you want, you can mask it and you can just inflate this. Uh, once again, I'll use the transpose line with right click, and it's just going to inflate it, and you're going to get like this um, this edge right off the bat. And uh, something else that I could have done right before that is save a morph target of this, uh, inflate it. And then I can decide that maybe some parts of the, the, the model should not have like an edge. So I can basically just like give it like, um, like a, a certain like uh, look. Uh, it's like offsetting from just like a, a constant mm -hmm. uh, edge like this. And uh, or something I like to do sometimes is uh, it's once again, it's the morph brush. I just put the focal shift to like almost 100. And you just like take a section, maybe like this one here, and you just press like not too long on it. And you can have kind of like a halfway 
like of the, 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 the length of this. So it just adds like a bit of, um, of uh, I don't know, like a, yeah, a offset. Change, yeah, a variation. Change, right? Yeah, a variation. Fine, sure. Yeah, there we go. There's a different type of layering happening. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There seems to be a theme today with layering. Are you right? watching oh, yes. leather? Leather upon leather with the yeah. God of War mm -hmm. team, and now That's he's true. doing. Yeah, correct. We find That's ourselves true. in the shot here live. Yeah. With Marco Plouffe. We're it's all about layers. Our it's all about layers. Yeah. I think my next the next time I come here, I'm just gonna talk about layers. Okay. I, I I say it right now. I come here for the fourth time. Just layers. Go. That's the theme. Layers. Mm -hmm. So to rule them all. One layer to rule them all. <laughs> <laughs> so this is one thing that I like to do. Um, another way that I, I like to play with the, uh, the trims here is to uh, take a mesh that would actually, kind of like damn standard when you use out, it kind of like uh, pushes thing out and it pinches it. Well, this is one brush that's called Orb Crack that I like to use a lot. And uh, when you use out, it uh, basically does this kind of like edges uh, here. And um, something that I like to do is, for example, I can take, um, I'll just use another layer. Once again, I'll mask like the front, but I'll keep the, the thickness uh, masked. I'll just blur it a little bit. And you can basically like take a section of your mesh, maybe a little bit bigger than that. And you can basically like manually add like um, a... Um, like a ridge. Yeah, a ridge, yeah, exactly, yeah, a ridge to it. Uh, sometimes you can even like mask like a portion of it like this. And then when you draw it, you, you have it already like sectioned off like this. I find this actually works pretty well That's as cool. well. And uh, so yeah, this is uh, something else. I, I actually did it on the character here, you can see. This is how I did this uh, portion. Um, of course, there's always the masks and everything. This is one of my favorite. Uh, anytime that you want to just like have your entire surface kind of like um, uh, I'm going to say layer again, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's fine. And I'm like yeah. layer in Do it. or whatever. You can just like mask it off. You find like a shape that's appealing, that, that, that uh, follows the, the line flow of your model. All right. You can have it like this. And um, my point is, is going to be to, all right, there we go. It's clean enough, I guess. If you move it, you can just like add like a different like layer on the model. But... There's many things that you can do before that. You can always, you can like move it just like on the side here to kind of like create like a, like a tapered, um, a tapered uh, leveling, let's say, layering, whatever. And this is basically, basically this is done uh, with the move brush and using the Alt key, which is basically going to push the mesh in the direction of the normal of the polygons. Uh, I really love this, uh, this brush. And, Something else that you can do uh, to the, uh, the masking just to have more variety is at this point, uh, maybe I'm gonna lower the resolution here. At this point, you can always play with the, the blurriness and the sharpness of the mask to kind of like round things off. So you see, I, I uh, blurred and sharpened. I will do it again. And the more that I do it, the more that like the shape itself becomes round. Uh, what I like about that is because it rounds the corners here. So sometimes I'll actually do a couple of them just around the corners, and then I'll remask another portion that I don't want it to be rounded, and it creates this kind of like shape where like these corners are rounded, these ones are a bit more sharp. So it's just more things that I can do. More things that you can do is you can also uh, blur with uh, control, the control key, which is basically going to blur in one direction of the mask only, and it creates for very cool like fall off effects when you push it in. So you see that like you have uh, the the rounding, and then like this edge here is sharper. So this is another like profile of uh, the mask that it creates, and uh, I think it's pretty cool. But for the example, I'll use this one, and I will basically move it like this. There you go. So now I have like this detail here. I always like to uh, give it just a little smooth afterwards. This may be too much. Just to kind of like blur it a little bit so it's not too, too sharp. And now you have this. And this is basically like the way that I go by uh, using my, uh, my masks. You can of course uh, do it like much bigger than that. You can, go, you can go and pass like planes. It doesn't need to be isolated into like uh, a section of your mesh. So there's like a lot that you can do in terms of uh, 
like using mask to control your shape. That does not look good, but uh, it could be. But if you use your imagination, you <laughs> well <Yeah>. placed. <laughs> I have that song in my head. Don't do it. We're gonna get it. Don't do it. Don't do it. We're gonna get tagged on the on the feed. So um, yeah, another tool that I like to use. Uh, this one is a fun one. This one uh, I get a lot of reaction when I use it. Uh, so trim hole. Um, so basically, what it does, it just like takes the angle of the camera. And it just like pushes, it pushed the mass like uh, forward. But if you actually move the cursor and you take like an angle to it, sometimes you can have like instantly some like pretty cool like effects, like something like that. Um, you can always smooth it or add some lazy mouse in, in case like you have like uh, strokes within like this section here. But the idea is that you can basically push your mesh uh, like this and get some pretty cool results um, just by like like experimenting with like the angle of the mesh and the movement of things, that sort of stuff. So you just play around, figure out, you, you'll find cool stuff to do. And um, the other one is uh, trim front. Trim front is kind of like the same idea. It's gonna take the angle of the camera and um, I like to place a, a, a small circle alpha on this one. And what you do is you just calculate like the angle of your, uh, of your mesh, and if you use out, it's just gonna bring everything to the same level depending on the angle of the camera. And this is how I do like those kind of like details here. Like it's pretty rapid to be able to do something that looks like a, it's just responding to a, like a portion of the, the surface. So uh, I like it. It looks old cool, school. are you kidding? Yeah, they're old school ones. Yeah, yeah. They're old school. Little nibs. They are, they are. But you see, it's like, that's that's just to say that like um, the things you can do with like simple brushes and ZBrush, yeah. depending on like the angle of this and that or whatever, you can join like, just a couple of things together and it just like creates a new effect. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can fall on like a very cool visual language that you just use for the rest of your career afterwards. Yeah. Like I do. He says fall into a visual <laughs> language that you use yeah. for the rest of your career. That's actually well said. You, well, you, like, I'm glad you said it. Are you kidding well, me? Well, you, you added the first part to it that I was like, oh, that's a better way of saying it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like that needs to go on your website. Maybe, eh? Yeah. There you go. I have yeah. to hire you guys for like PR and stuff. Hey, no. Hey, no. Huh? Hey, oh. <laughs> hey, oh. Um, of course, mold lines is uh, something uh, very um, important when you do yeah. uh, hard surface stuff. Um, basically, mold lines, I like, I, I use two profiles of uh, mold lines. The ones that uh, the dam standard gives me, which is pretty much like, a, like a, a round fall off and then like a sharp edge. And orb crack, which gives me uh, two hard edges. So depending on like maybe the other um, visual language that you used on your armor, you'll decide to go for like one profile or the other. But this is pretty much like what I'm going for. So you take orb crack, you go in strokes, you basically maybe augment the lazy radius, and you'll, get, you'll just get like more control over um, doing the lines here. Um, so for example, let's say I take it here. I save the amorph target because I know that I'm going to maybe like draw over things that I don't want to draw over, like this thing here. Uh, so basically, at any point, I can always just go here and I can um, get it back. Actually, sorry, no, I didn't do it correctly. There we go. Like if nothing happened. And this I would do at the end after I'm done with all my, my, my when my mold lines are done, so I don't do it for every line, right? Mm -hmm. And once that I have this, I like to add some, um, some offsetting or some variety to the mold line so that they're not like just always constant. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll just add like a, an extra line inside. I'll just take like, a, like a, a bigger radius and I'll just do like a line on a line so it just it has like a portion of it that's been kind of like... Um, uh, a line on a line. A line on a line. It's made me think of Dracula for some reason. Mm. And you can just use also the uh, uh, the standard brush if you want to do like a like a lip a here, a ridge. Yeah, some ridge. Really so hard. basically, it's just to say that once you've drawn a line, you can add on top of it just to get, like make it a little bit more like rich, right? Because you're not going to want to make. Uh, mold lines like this everywhere and make it too busy. So sometimes what it's fun is to make one line but add complexity to this line and it's gonna make the entire thing look like rich without looking too um, busy. Yeah, exactly. 
so there's that. And um, I mean, the last thing in terms of like uh, the, the shape themselves, it's pretty much just like IMMs at this point. So the way that I go by adding IMMs is I always create a new, um, a new mesh. And this, me this mesh will, I will remove all the layers, all the subdivision levels, and I can actually just start placing uh, IMMs on them. So you just take anything from any library that you have, something that looks kind of, uh, kind of cool, and uh, it's just a matter of placing it, good old IMMs. And once I have this, I just make everything disappear but the IMM. I delete what is hidden, and I have uh, my two subtools here uh, together like this. Uh, once you have one IMM placed, this is where I'll be like placing other IMMs using this uh, subtool because it doesn't have layers or uh, whatnot, so you won't have any like. Um, warnings of like, oh, you can do this because there's layers and that sort of stuff. So yeah, um, and IMMs, um, I mostly use IMMs for like those kind of like small details, maybe like belt buckles or like buttons like this. Um, sometimes like, uh, like circular joints on the character. But I try to not use any IMM for like what's my major shapes of my character. That I, I try to have like agency over it. Mm -hmm. So it's always going to be for like smaller stuff that like I will be uh, personally uh, using them. So um, now we're getting into like more like detail stuff, but detail stuff, I find that it, th there's not like really like much to say because in the end, uh, I find that like detail is more about uh, visual language than anything because all my detailing, most of my detailing at least, it's all done using just like the simple brush and placing alphas and stuff like that. So it's really a matter of just like figuring out uh, shapes that you think look good on your character and trying like placement until like it actually like resonates there, there's there's an old theory about like uh, Details and choices and that sort of stuff, right? But that's a whole other book for sure But the idea is that you can get like a lot done just by having like a few alphas that you find inspiring and just like testing like how does it look in like certain areas the one tip I would give is a bit like I said for the line, is try to not, not add details everywhere. Just have specific areas that like you add details there and put your details right there. So it creates kind of like a balance of like empty sections and sections where there's like details and what. Can I interject for a second? Some breathing room. Yeah. What, speaking of breathing room, yeah. what's the resolution on this piece right now? The, like in terms of like uh, the polygon polygons? count, he's asking polygon count. How many polygons are on that? Thing? Um, it's uh, there are no subdivision 10? levels, correct? One million. Ah, okay. One million. Subdivision. One million. How many subdivisions you got on there? Uh, five. Five. There you go. And, and he doesn't does remesh, right? You don't remesh this because it's already no, remeshed. It's already no, remesh. this is yeah. This is really like the, the final mesh. Yeah, the That's final it. mesh. And it's quite simple. I mean, I, I just wanted to draw people's attention to that. It doesn't have to be sort of a, a gabillion polygons. It's only a million, mm -hmm. and it looks that tight and smooth because of all the planning. I just wanted to pause and give people that kind of moment to reflect on that. Yeah. You know what's interesting also about oh, that is <laughs> you. <laughs> it's um, the. Um, in terms of like working fast, you have also to be smart about like how dense your mesh is because like even the best computer at some point is gonna start to uh, is gonna start to have problems. Like chug chug a like, lug me. Pardon? Like chug chug a lug me. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> hey, listen. Absolutely. We're here live. Yeah. So basically, um, the um, the the the. Uh, Jesus Christ. Um, I really yeah. threw you off on that one. No, 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 that's good. The polygons, that's sorry, good. I really took it. We're all good. On chug, chug, a lug me, really threw them off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really you, just, you got me on a journey yeah. right there for a second. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I didn't need it. I needed a flashback of a different guy. You need some reflection time on that one. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I was on the Take a water break for a minute here. <laughs> take a sip. Everybody have a sip. Everyone have a sip. Have a sip. You at home, too, take a sip of water. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Brought you should have taken the cue that it was actually time for water. It wasn't, but you had a look on your face like you'd got, like I'd taken you back to like some sinful nights in Montreal. Exactly. <laughs> Time stopped for me. I went on I did, a I saw journey. It, now I'm back here. I'm just like, like Brutopia, circa 2002. <laughs> I'm on stage right now making a presentation. What's happening? Exactly. So, uh, <laughs> at this point, at this point, the uh, what I wanted to say is that since you talked about like resolution and that sort of stuff, for me, like there's two things I want to say. The first one is that. Uh, to be able to be efficient, I never try to go over what's my need in terms of subdivision. So what I'll do, I didn't show it, but about, what I'll do is when I start adding subdivisions to my mesh, sometimes what I'll do is I'll just take an alpha that is kind of like um, 
like an alpha that will be probably like the smallest that I think I'm going to go for my needs. And I'm just going to check like how it reacts to the subdivision, to the maximum subdivision that I give it. So maybe I would have like subdivided to four, place that detail, realize it's too pixelated, subdivide to five, check that detail and see like, okay, you know what? This has enough resolution for like the, uh, the, the, the renders that I'm gonna go for at the end. A contextualized resolution, not just yes. resolution for the sake of saying I have like, you know, this thing has 10 million points, but in Absolutely. context, right? Absolutely, and this is, uh, I think is very important because it, you'll, you'll get to really know like what you're going for, what you're aiming for, and you won't create like uh, excess, in t especially in terms of stuff that is very like costly for like your processor or your RAM or that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. Uh, and in the end, you'll be able to work like on a full-size character like death in one scene just because you made those smart choices. So you basically have to tell yourself, well, okay, what am I doing? Am I doing a full character? Am I focusing on the head? Uh, what are the renders I'm going to show at the end? And know that like you might not need to go like so crazy on the details in this area or the like resolution or, yeah, or I've that, said that sort of for stuff. Years. Intent should drive your workflow. You know, and, and yeah. what is the intention, the final product? What is it for? And, and yeah, you know, what are you trying but, to make and what for? But sometimes when you don't know where you're going, it's right. like you'll let yourself driven, drive by. Uh, you, it allows, you'll let yourself be driven by like uh, subdividing just because you want the resolution yeah. to be good without knowing what's really or chasing easy. design yeah. without having a, a clear path. You know. Yeah. Exactly. And um, I just want to show you like this example here. Um, Look at this, Paul. Wow. So um, like once again, like this is the uh, the print of uh, death, right? Captain Happy, I call him. Yeah, Captain. <laughs> exactly. Time for the last ride. Hey, he's having a laugh. He's having a laugh. It's not <laughs> so, because he looks crazy that he cannot. Die. Someone's going to be having a laugh at that final moment. It yeah, ain't me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or maybe everyone. Uh, they don't Perhaps. Know. But basically, the the point of like showing you this. Uh, well, first of all, is because I think it's lovely. But the second reason is because um, talking about like what's the result that you're trying to get, uh, especially when it comes to printing, you're gonna want to basically know how small that you can get in terms of your detail sure. uh, and what's going to actually uh, translate once it's printed. Because depending on like if it's like a like a one for one scale, one fourth, one tenth, whatever the size you're going for. Uh, at some point, you're not gonna wanna go like too fine into the details because it's just gonna look blurry at the end because it's not gonna print what correctly. What size is this thing? Uh, this one is one fourth. So basically it's like, well, I don't know if like people are gonna see, but whatever. Let's say like a little bit more than a half a meter high and half a meter wide. It's, it's massive. It's really massive. It's gigantic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, well, half actually, a meter, half a meter If you're gonna do high, it, do it big. Yeah, half a meter exactly. in height. There's probably like a picture here of like. And just to break this down for our folks watching all over the world, I uh, think that they is big. Have one on their site. That is big. Yeah, there, there was a uh, like I would need to. I know where there's like a picture. It's just I would need to look for it. But there's like Let a picture see. of like somebody beside the statue, and it's like. Like how many centimeters are we talking about? Uh, in centimeters? Yeah. Yeah, inches. like uh, in, in inches for the for the American. Oh, dude. Oh, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> How many centimeters? <laughs> Math. How many it's, centimeters? Yeah, I mean, there's the actual size in the. Oh, you, you see, you, you know what? There you go. You're asking me a question about technical stuff. It's written right here on this page. That's what I was hoping. There you go. Dimensions okay. in well millimeters. So okay. There you go. How many millimeters? Whoop. Uh, 450 by 510 by 840. Wow. So yeah, like half a meter. Wow. In, uh, that is a big piece. Yeah, and also one meter in height because I because of like the size and everything. Like it's this one. One meter in height. Almost. 550 millimeters is uh, like about 21 inches, 20 yeah. inches, close to 22 inches. That's a big boy. For, for Americans. Oh, it's a big it's boy. It's a big boy. It weighs probably like close to 70, 80 pounds. Can I it's weatherproof it and put it in front of my house to scare the neighbors away? You can. You can. Yes. But I think somebody's pro probably just going to capture it and take it home. That's actually true. That's what I would do. Especially actually. where I live. And um, so basically the idea is to know like what's uh, the end product. So the end product for this one was the, the statue you just you just saw. And because of like the scale, I knew that. What Paul's I, doing over here? He's just doing a hand job. Yeah. It's well, 85 centimeters by 81 centimeters here, by 56 is, centimeters. What, yeah, exactly. Like I see myself in the, the camera right there and it's not, I can't even like do it. Like it's the frame is not even like. It's bigger than the frame he's in. Okay, so yeah. that gives us an idea. If someone at home is measuring this and put it on their shelf. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. like, I'm going to buy this. Please tell us. Right? I'm Someone's gonna... looking, hey, ha that goes back to hashtag it. The right? measurement of your desk for Marco's thing. Hashtag yeah. ZBS22. It's a good challenge. <laughs> Who can yeah. fit it away? Well, that's the one they're supposed to be sending to doing their selfies. If you got a selfie out there, do it. 
selfie however you're watching us. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. There's some good right. ones. I've been looking at them. There's some fun, fun ones. Look at this thing, though. I'm, can, can you maximize that screen? Look at this thing. Get me off the screen and show the they people can. a pony. I mean, jeeez. Yeah. Look at the detail on that thing. And it's two heads. Kendari, let's get the... Yeah, yeah there's two heads oh switch out. This one also has like a, a hand switch out. I have like this one. Oh, with you the, have a hand switch out too. Yeah, yeah. There's like the grasping hand and the, the hand that has a, the, the you know, time... Oh, man, I'll tell you what I do. Yeah, yeah. Did you make any compartment for the switching out or they just... There's no compartment for them. Compartment? Yeah, I always wonder this with the hand switch outs and stuff and the head switch stuff for collectibles. Why we don't put something in the base that you can store when you're not using the That's one true, hand? That's true, right? Underneath. So it's not just laying on your shelf, what right? You pull out a little thing, it's stored hey, there, it's You need to go pack in this. Uh, right saying, you're making them. <laughs> I want a little LED inside that thing. Oh. Yeah, I, yeah, that would be pretty rad. Yeah, that's that's the cost then going up. Oh, that's me. Yeah, I'll, cost, I'll yeah, customize yeah, exactly. my own. Well, for this, one, for this one, we wanted to go like artist series. It was like more relying on like the, like the paint of it, like yeah. more like uh, traditionally, let's say. <laughs> Look at this thing. Yeah. I mean... But it's nice. I want to be that guy. Look at him. I'm happy. I'm really happy of what XM did with the, the paint job. Like I gave them a lot of freedom as long as they follow like the important ideas. Of you didn't like give them a changes. master. Did you just give them a ZBrush master or anything for paint? Uh, I gave them free. I gave them re renders. The renders that I had yeah. and like they did a first pass and then I was like, okay, well this like color needs to be like hotter or warmer. And I really just like made th these uh, th these uh, changes in case that it actually like goes a little bit too outside of like the theme right. of like what they are. But like. Choices for like how the skin would look or like the some hues and stuff or uh, like I was like you know what you're the experts so you know how it's gonna look once it's going to be printed painted and everything and uh, like I trusted them a lot in, in those choices and you know what pretty happy with it. That's a great that's a great look at that piece. Yeah, a great horse. So basically, wow. Paul. Um, to get back on track, the idea is like if you look at details like uh, this one here or like this little dot like this little dot or at least, you know what, this little dot and this line right here, it's pretty much like the, um, like the smallest that I, I would actually go for in terms of deciding the scale of a detail. No, not you. He really wants to be in the shot, this one. I keep going. Second time or third time that guy's made an appearance. There's something to be yeah. said about it. He really wants it. He really but, wants uh, it. But if you look at it here, like you see, like this is pretty much like the finest line that I will go for. Because when you do 3D printing, you kind of like have to be conscientious about um, yeah, the final result. The same way that like the uh, the perforation uh, here on the the cape, like this was pretty much like the size that I knew already that one fourth would look good. Because if I go actually smaller, they would start they would start to go to look really like shallow, and it would just not look good. So you really have to stop yourself a certain sometimes for like the scale of things and that sort of stuff. Um, and I like to go in between. I like to go as small as I can so that like it's nice for the renders, but also smart so that like it prints correctly. So I'm truly trying to hit like both worlds at the same time uh, as much as I can. Um, so yeah, so that was for the, uh, the, the the details and that sort of stuff. Let me get back on track. Where was I? Here. There we go. Okay. So yeah, detail placement, that's really just like what there is. It's, uh, it's all a matter of like choices and most of it I do just by placing alphas uh, like this. And uh, sometimes, uh, since I have a form lab at home, sometimes I do like test prototypes of sections. Do you have a form two or form three? Form two. Form I two. wish I had a form three. Mm. It looks really good. But uh, you know what, my form two is still like Rocks. incredible, it, yeah. the details I've are really nice. Too. Yeah, yeah, and I get like I can do my prototypes and stuff, and I can see that like things work well. And then when I send it to like a like a production studio or whatever, I'm I know that like it's gonna look like okay at the end, right. even yeah. better, right? Because they're better than me. It's just at least I tested. Um, Is the perforated cloth that you were showing was that micro poly? Someone was asking what the cloth was. It was like how I did pattern. it. Yeah. Oh well, you know what? That's exactly what I was going to show. Look at this. This, there you go. Go. this stuff right itself. It's all, all in the same mindset. Oh, that's incredible. Look at this. Kind of scripted the thing, even if I wanted to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so basically, the way that I go uh, at it is uh, I'll just like use UVs for uh, a lot of like this stuff. The moment that like a pattern really gets like over the entire character, I'll rely on uh, UVs to do this. So I'll start by working on a clone, of course. Even ZBrush tells you to work on a clone, so you listen. Yep. Uh, I'm gonna bake everything, make sure it doesn't have any subdivision levels. And so once that you have this uh, here, okay, so we see the topology. All right, so uh, basically I'll uh, simply use the poly groups that I have and I'll just make sure that my front section plus 
the thickness of it is on one polygroup and that the back is on another polygroup. Once that I have this, I'll simply tell him uh, split by polygroup, make it symmetrical, and unwrap. And it's going to go pretty fast. And if I put like a texture on it, you'll see that, uh, there we go. So I have like this texture. It's already placed symmetrically, if that's a word. And if I do flatten, you can see it's already symmetr symmetrical. So you're all good. Um, I think Danny uh, Bell yesterday like showed a bit of like the UVs. And you, you see yeah, like you drawing can the pretty much like orient them right away so that it really goes in the direction of your patterns and everything. And I find that like if you just like cut things on their seams or for metal plates, you cut them on their like what's the front, what's the back, you'll always have like the chance to put things in the direction that you want for it to look like. Um, I love that our presenters are watching the presentations and watching yeah. the presenters and coming back <laughs> and talking about each other before and after. Well, I was just trying to make sure like I don't repeat stuff no, no, too no, much as great. well. And like when he showed that, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to say a quick word. I think this one is a great one to compound. Go ahead. Yeah, for sure. So once I have this, you just copy UVs. You put it in your, uh, in your object here. Uh, so paste UVs. And uh, so now you can actually like, have the same texture here just to confirm. You see, you're good, you're good. And the way that I go by is uh, I'll uh, create a morph target. I'm going to work on a layer. I'm going to go into surface, noise. I'm going to tell him, use UVs. I'm going to use the plugin here. I'm going to take spheres. I'm going to say OK. And then I'll just, um, since we're doing something hard surface, I'll get rid of the noise. I'll just take the effect by itself. And I'll, I'll reduce the plugin until I have like the size that I'm going for. Let's say this one. I'm going to augment. Actually, I'm going to not use any poly paint. And I'm going to play with the strength to know like how deep I want to go and like if I'm going up or down. Once I got this, I click OK. Now it's on my mesh. For the moment, it's just a preview. But if I actually apply to mesh, it's going to apply this uh, detail on my layer here. From the layer, I can duplicate the layer to double the intensity. Uh, I can merge it. So now it's on one layer. And from there, I can apply also a morph target to this, hide my layer, and just draw where I want this detail to, uh, to appear. So you get like a lot of control. Um, by having it done all over your character, and then you decide where exactly you want it to appear. Like right now, it looks kind of weird like this. Like maybe it would be best if it's actually like maybe inside of a section, but that's basically like the way that I go by to use. This guy's these. on fire. Yeah. So many tricks, many tricks. There's a lot more. They call sure. him Marco Many Tricks Ploof. <laughs> There you go, Marco of all things. Yeah, Marco, many tricks. The shortest for, board of sports. tips and tricks. <laughs> <laughs> many tricks on a Tuesday. Tricky yeah. Tuesday. Bring Tricky the Tuesday. <laughs> right. Tuesday. Tricky Tuesday, live with the ZBrush crew. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, like, that's pretty much like all of the major tricks that I use when it comes to creating details and uh, medium details. So from, um, from this uh, point out, if you just use everything, and you apply it to all of the meshes of the character, you'll pretty much end up with, uh, with this like, fully, um, fully finished uh, model here. Like, once again, nothing that is on screen right now, or I'd say easily 99% of everything that you see on screen right now, I've just shown all of the tricks in, my, in the past minutes. So it's, yeah, it's really just a matter of uh, rinse and repeat, uh, going at things, and uh, there you go. Time check for you. You got about 19 minutes. 19 minutes? Yep. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. All right. Well, OK. Well, I have like two sections I wanted to talk about. The last one is not really that Take important. Take your time. Take your time. We'll so, get there. Uh, I'll, just, uh, I'll just jump right in into like the, uh, the last portion that for me I think is really important for like the entire presentation in terms of uh, uh, posing, the character, uh, posing the character in composition. So we're going to talk about, well, posing the character. Yeah. Um, the demonstration I'm going to do is uh, something that takes a lot of time if you want to do it well. Uh, people think that like posing the character should be done like quickly and that you should not have to redo anything and that's not the case. That's yeah, a the bit idea, of a fantasy. Yeah, exactly. It's a fantasy. Yeah. But you know what? Sometimes it's, it works pretty well and sometimes you have to redo some parts. But the thing is that you have to be smart about it as well. And for having tested it on like close to like 60, 70 models, 
complex models, this technique works. You just have to know like what to be careful about. So when you're posing, actually, you know what? I'll just say I'm going to do a little demonstration here. But if you want to see like the full process on a character, just go on uh, chaosmasons.com. Go at the bottom. Go on our links. Uh, you'll find our YouTube page. And on the YouTube page, if you check our playlist, there's one that's called um, Mantis. You're, so you're, you're doing YouTube. I shared your Twitch. So your YouTube? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the Twitch is the videos. It's just they're archived on YouTube as well, right? They just watch this for free on the YouTube. Well. You watch them for free. This is unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. They just have to. They just have gotcha. to injure me, and the rest is free. What so a time there you to go. be Sharing away. Sharing away. Sharing away. Yeah, and uh, so you know what? While we're uh, while I'm I'm saying this, I'm just going to uh, delete a few uh, a few meshes because one thing that you have to be careful when you're working with um, Transpose Master is that if you have like a lot of Z tools open, like I have right now, Z tools of like millions and millions of polygons, you kind of like have to be careful um, because it can actually make the software crash because this is like ludicrous, the amount of like things that I have in the RAM in this instance. So let me just delete those. All right, and I'll open my... And of course, for the younger viewers watching, you would have named all of your tools, correct? <laughs> They're named. They're named. Just checking. You would have named your subtool. You mean PM3D underscore 69? Yeah, we know this. PM3D underscore 62 yeah. is not a name? No. No, okay. No. Final We've, 7, final 8, eight. final really, the final 1. Really, six. really, really the final. Yeah, really. yeah final, final. <laughs> the final with the change. This time, it's really the final. Like, the name is just like... And then my last name, because they're submitting it to me as a student. Exactly. Not good. Yeah. Name your name your files. So um, so basically, yeah, the, the the YouTube was just to say that like I show the entire process. I spend like I think four hours posing like a fully mechanic mechanical character. So the proof is there. The technique works. But just to give you a bit of a taste of like what I do is first of all, I always try to make sure that like the design of the character allows for for uh, bending parts and that sort of stuff. So uh, for the, these characters, I really try to make sure that like everything around like the the waist here or like the elbow. Um, it's, it's like a material that can be flexed. And if not, if it's a joint, I really try to, I kind of like test during the blocking that if you turn the object around the joint, that it's not going to penetrate with each mm -hmm. other, right? So uh, clip into each other. So this, I did that. Uh, sorry, I did this for this guy here. And for things like, for example, the, the shoulder here, I really try to make sure that things are kind of like modeled in a way that like things can slide into each other. So you see like all the plates here on the shoulder. Basically, if the character like lifts his arm, well, the, the plates can slide into one of each other. And this is going to give me a lot of flexibility for placing this character into the, the final pose. So I, I, I try to make like smart choices like this. Uh, but at the end, uh, like my technique still works for uh, like a lot of um, different design decisions. Let's say I'm going to show you. Um, so okay, well, one thing that I can say as well is that I try to separate my model into sections. So, for example, like the arms, I'm going to section them like this. Uh, the legs are going to be sectioned. And I'm going to actually, sometimes I'm going to pose like just a portion of the character. Like I could be posing this first and then the rest afterwards, or even like a section like this. And the reason why I don't pose everything at the same time is just to give me a break. I'll place like a portion of it, and then I'll commit my Transpose Master, and I'll save my project, and then I'll go back to Transpose Master. Because the thing is that at the end of the day, I have the, um, I have the, the, the final posed model already done. Like, I'm posing the character over this model here. So it's like, I, I figured that out. What we were seeing at the mm -hmm. beginning of the presentation is like, there's no unknown, or almost no unknown for me. You so I just need going. to pose you know my character. Like you what? know your end results. You know yeah. exactly your end finish line. So if I pose my character on top of this guy here, there's nothing that's going to really like go wrong, or at least nothing that cannot be like, easily fix afterwards. <clears throat> so the way that I'm going to go to do this is I'm going to figure out a section I want to pose. Let's say this one here. I'm going to go into um, my Z plugin, transpose master here. Oops. And I'm simply going to click on transpose master. It's going to make all the cal calculation necessary to uh, pose the character. And then 
I'll start by putting into polygroups elements that I know that I might actually uh, pose one at the, at the same time or in two parts, let's say. The entire uh, underbody of the character will be one section and the plates will be its own section on top of be able to uh, separate them what is like the belt section and the thigh section. So I'll work with these three things here. Uh, since we're posing the character in, um, sorry, since we're posing the character in a non-symmetrical position, I'll actually have different polygroups for uh, everything that's like symmetry and whatnot. And the legs here, the underbody, I'm gonna start by just like really quickly masking a portion of it just to be able to select it rapidly. I'll try to have it like follow kind of like the, the flexion areas of the body. Then I'll do the same for like the upper part here, like this. So those are my sections and this one I'm also going to make non-symmetrical, all right? And I will add my final pose in this, um, in this file here. Warning, before a uh, committing the transpose master, you have to delete uh, this extra subtool that I added, or else it's going to confuse the software. So just a reminder to delete this one here. But basically, we have our final model. Uh, I just need to pose uh, my polished model on top of this here. It's also important to note that you're, you know, you've posed it in a way that is not overtly extreme away from the standard uh, pose that you had at the beginning. Yeah, it's not going to be um, going from like an A pose to something that is drastically different. Um, but it, it could though, it's just it that can, you, would need, you would need to plan ahead and like your, the pose, you would just need to make sure that like, if the character is really gonna do like an, a, right. an exaggerated like elevation like this, well his giant shoulder maybe is not a good thing, right? That's exactly what I was hoping you were gonna say. <laughs> and also I mean like in real life, it's like you have this much armor, you don't have flexibility, so don't choose like a, a, a position that doesn't work. Right, Anyways, you've broken the context of that design. Absolutely. So um, what I'll do is I'll start by placing the pivot. This is pretty much how I start like every posing of my characters. I'll just figure out like like that the just trying to make sure that like the angle is like somewhat what I'm going for. Uh, this one actually is going to need to be rotated a bit like this. All right. And when it's time to place the limbs, I'm going to actually add a layer just to make sure I can go back and I can simply mask, blur. And a little warning, little warning over here. Um, it's always best to make sure that the topology of what's gonna bend is not drastically different one from the other. Because when you're blurring your mask, the spread of the blur is gonna act differently if your me mesh is dense or not dense. So like the blurriness, and I made it on purpose to actually make a little mistake here, but if you look at the, um, the tube here, it's very high, and the thigh is much bigger than that. So because I blurred, uh, once you're going to place, like you're gonna move the character like this, the bending of the cloth, well, it doesn't really show, but the bending of, but bending of the cloth will act differently on the high density mesh and the low density mesh. So this is something you just have to be a little bit careful about. And uh, maybe you'll want to uh, remove some subdivision levels of your mesh just so that it uh, kind of like, um, uh, it's, it's more like averaged with the rest. Yeah, in essence, so. make every first level be relatively the same type of polygon size. Exactly that. So you're getting consistency with your bend and your masks. And yeah. all, on all of them as low as possible without degradating the, the design. Yeah, mm -hmm. keep that silhouette. Man, the three of us, we should have a show. Wait a minute, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> like, we'll, we'll talk about during the pause, I think. <laughs> yeah. Chug, chug, lug me. So the... <laughs> <laughs> no, I distracted him again. <laughs> so at this point, um, what I'll do is I'll take some of my meshes that were maybe like bent or that doesn't make any sense if like that they're curved and I'm gonna use the occasion to kind of like just straighten things out a little bit and uh, this is something you can do also like at the end, but uh, it's also something you can just do once that you know that like you've placed your thing correctly. You just like try to get rid of like any impressions of stretching just by replacing things correctly like this. And this is also why I made uh, some like more, uh, like some smart choice into like what's hard surface and what's flexible because areas like this, since it's gonna bend a lot, you just really wanna make sure that it's like an object that if you bend it, it's not gonna like remove the 
the nature of like what it is. So I'll do this. I'll, for example, I'll, I'll mask the, the armor here and I'll start like, oops, putting, it, putting things back into like place. And the reason why I do this uh, with Transpose Master is really just because like I get to move everything at the same time. I'll still do a pass where like if, uh, each of my sub tools, I'll just scrutinize them and see if I've added any like bend. But this is basically like how I go uh, at placing them all together like this. And uh, also, I'll, sometimes I'll just hide them and um, I'll mask portions of them just to maybe like add some mass that I might have lost during the, uh, the move. And once I replace the mesh, if I see that my mesh are interpenetrating like this here, well, this is why I said earlier that like this entire like layering of object is, um, is really helping because when you layer stuff, you get to place them back afterwards. Um, you just have to find like something that looks just like like, would make sense. That makes sense, yeah, exactly. And also, by the way, don't, don't shy away from uh, using the move brush to move your things, because the things, like move brush, the problem that sometimes like, it can have is that if you use it like on, um, if you use it on, um, on like a hard surface object, sometimes it can bend some areas that you don't want it to bend, but the idea is that pretty much everything can be bent without looking bent, except for stuff like primitive shapes. So stuff like the circle here, the moment that you bend it, now it looks absolutely off. But like plates that don't really have like very primitive shapes in it, you can move it and it's, it's not gonna look like that bent. So the idea that like you cannot reshape a hard surface object is not true. You actually, you really can. It's just some stuff is more sensible to the eye. Um, and some is not really sensible. So you see this plate, which was hard surface, well, I pretty much like bend it to kind of like fill the holes and do all that stuff. And this is how I'm actually gonna go by to uh, place the entire character. And the one final thing, how much minute do I have? Uh, I would say probably- Seven minutes. Seven minutes, I seven was gonna minutes? say that, seven, seven minutes. Seven minutes. All right. I thought I was timing you. So the one thing I'll say is that um, I've, I've shown that like, I use like, polygroups and masking and blurring to move my object. But like I said, sometimes the topology is just going to make things not really move equally. Like for example, if I take this upper body part here and I just blur it and move it. So you see that like, all the meshes are kind of like um, separating from each other and you're creating negative space. And I think of, a lot of things are not really like bending accordingly. So what I do to average this uh, mask, but to the same kind of like spread along all of the different meshes with their different density, is I place my mask uh, by hand, just using uh, the mask with the, uh, the dot stroke like this. So really just by hand. And the reason why I do it by hand like this it's because um, the, the, the radius of your brush will apply the same strength of mask everywhere on every vertices at the same intensity. It doesn't have to do with like, the density of the mesh. It really like, just makes it much more equal. So you kind of like, have by hand to uh, make that kind of like fade or that gradient. But once you do, and you don't need to be like, extremely um, like, precious about like, the spreading, after that, you see the way that it's going to bend, it's not going to do like all the separations and everything because the vertices were pretty much allowed the same kind of like movement and range. So you do this, you place it into position, and now you can actually keep your mask and already start to kind of like move the mesh around to give it more of like, um, like a flow that's going to look maybe less like bent. Sorry, I keep pressing on the... The right. Uh, that's great. Just keep doing what you're doing. Looking good. <laughs> there you go. Marco, many tricks ploof here on a Tuesday. Uh, Tricky Tuesdays. There you go. Magic fingers. Zebra Marco Summit 2022. Ploof. I really want tacos now. Yeah. Well, you Actually, you know what? I'm going for Mexican sport, after. Hey, there thanks you go. a lot, There pal. you go. Look at that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Perfect. We're here all week. Perfect. Think of us uh, while you're eating that taco. We're down to, <laughs> we got about 90, what is it? Uh, 180 seconds are left here. Two and a half minutes. Three Perfect. Minutes. What did you say? Three minutes. About three minutes left. 
okay, well, you know what? That's it's pretty much done. The idea is that like because of like that mask, I was able to move things in a way that like is not like really spreading everything around. Um, w once I apply the um, the transpose master to this, like I'll just do it. Don't forget to delete that mesh. Yeah. Don't oh, yeah, don't forget. Uh, there we go, don't forget like this. To delete. And here, brother. Boom. Uh, transpose. So this is like the step where like if I had like a ton of Z tool open, it might actually be problematic. Uh, so now that I actually uh, remove from the RAM most of it, it's going to find correctly like the mesh. It's going to apply the changes. Everything should be fine. So you see it's already moving things around. The best part about this, you get to see all of his sub tools. Mm -hmm. Somebody at home wants to know what, what happens if I change my mind after I do that? Change your mind about what? Change your mind. About the pose, yeah. What happens if they change their mind? Then well, I mean, at some point, you kind of like have to commit, and this is why you, uh -huh. you, you do a lot of iterations you could do blocking a until yeah. you figure out which is the one you want. But the idea is that if you actually pose it like this and you, you still have changes to do, you can always go back and transpose master afterwards and replace it and do changes and whatever. So you can go and transpose master as much time as you want over this process until you figure out that the, the, the final posing of your character actually uh, looks good. Yes. So there we go. But at some point, you must commit. Don't be commit. Uh, yeah, commit exactly. Phobic. Plus, I mean, at this point here, like, there's still like some stretches in some areas. Like, I'll still go go right. over like areas that were maybe a bit problematic, and like move things around just to just remove a bit of the impression of the of the the stretching. But the idea is that those are the most problematic sections that I just showed you. The like the rest is much more of a breeze, and you don't get much like distortion and that sort of stuff. So it ends up being like a really cool. Um, like a really uh, viable way for posing characters that are pretty complex and like any kind, any kind of, of character. Like, I mean, if you're posing a character that's organic with like anatomy and everything, you're still gonna have to like rework like how the anatomy is after like deflection. So the same idea that stuff have to be um, like fixed after this step is applicable to organic or to hard surface. Okay, so, let's finish with your model in, in its uh, entirety on the screen, perhaps. Show the, show the yeah, whole Yeah, well, actually, you know what? I'm kind of like, I'm loading, loading this model here. Okay, and oh, the, this is one of my faves. Yeah, the idea is just to, to, to show you that, like, at the same time, uh, characters, depending on, like, their style or, or, any, or anything, every trick that I showed here um, can be applic uh, applic um, applicable. applied. Applied. Applicable. Applied. applied, yeah, all the things. Can be applied to any style or anything like that, or I, at least the range of possibility is pretty vast. So for something that like looks compact like this, I'll use the same, same, same method to get the, the same oh, results and everything. So uh, the sky is the limit. Wow. It's an angel, right? It's, it's, it's the sky is the limit, and it's come to that time when we reach for the sky and stretch a bit and say thank you so much. Marco, many tricks, Plouffe, here. Uh, merci beaucoup, monsieur. Ben, ça fait plaisir. Ma, et, superbe, superbe. For our <laughs> French correspondents and people at home, he's got a big smile on his face. We appreciate it. Uh, I'm Louis Tucci here live for the ZBrush Summit 2022 with Paul Gabriel. We're going to send you off and we're going to do some giveaways. So thank you again to Marco Plouffe. And I'm sure their fans along, along all over the world are saying yes, 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 more, more, more. <laughs> but uh, we'll be back after this with some giveaways. All right. Thanks. So awesome. Much. Thanks, Mark.